Welcome explorers of the world's great mysteries. I'm Doug Kenyon, editor and publisher of Atlantis Rising Magazine. We call this program simply Conversations, and we feature the many great contributors to our publication, world-class researchers who dare to follow real evidence where it leads and let the chips fall where they may. In just a moment, we'll be talking to author and Atlantis Rising columnist, Michael Cremo. But first, for those of you unfamiliar with Atlantis Rising Magazine, let me introduce you to our publication. Focusing on ancient mysteries, unexplained anomalies, and future science, Atlantis Rising has been for many years providing a serious forum for alternative ideas of prehistory, science, and culture. Ideas which, when not entirely ignored by the mainstream press, are yet seldom treated with the respect they deserve. Our magazine appears bi-monthly in printed form, and you can find it on stands in most major chain bookstores, such as Barnes & Noble, Hastings, Books A Million, etc. And it's also available for many New Age outlets and independent stores. If your favorite magazine dealer doesn't carry it, ask why. For iPad users, our free app can be found at the Apple App Store. Postal subscriptions are also available worldwide, and you can get it in PDF form on an issue-by-issue -issue basis directly from our website, AtlantisRising.com. Among the many great articles in our May-June 2014 issue is an eye-opening story by investigative reporter Patrick Marsalek. It's called Lost Tribes, and it's about the enduring search for the lost heirs of the biblical Jacob. Uh, some of the latest research, including DNA tracking, may startle you. Then there's Morphic Fields and DNA by William B. Stecker. My life on Earth is not explained by genetics alone. In Challenging the Illusions of Death, Cynthia Logan has a game-changing conversation with top biologist Robert Lanza. And in Pathological Skepticism, leading psychiatrist Dr. D.W. Krieger explains why some minds will never open. You'll we'll also find a very exciting column by our current guest. Michael Cremo is a member of the World Archaeological Congress and the uh, European Association of Archaeologists, as well as an associate member of the Bhaktivedanta Institute, specializing in history and philosophy of science. Highly sought after as a lecturer, he's an author and the, uh, with the late Richard Thompson of the underground classic Forbidden Archaeology, the hidden history of the human race. He's also written Human Devolution, a Vedic alternative to Darwin's theory. His recent publications include My Science, My Religion, as well as The Forbidden Archaeologist, a collection of his columns written for our own Atlantis Rising magazine. His website is at humandevolution.com. Welcome to Atlantis Rising Conversations, Michael. Good to be with you and all your readers and listeners. Well, thank you. Um, in your column for the uh, May-June issue of Atlantis Rising, you talk about discoveries made in the 1920s in an Oklahoma gravel pit of human artifacts from a geological period millions of years before conventional archaeology says such a thing was possible. That such things do happen, you've documented at length in your book, Forbidden Archaeology, but that's not what we are told by the academic establishment. Could you explain that to us? Well, the academic establishment would say that the first human beings like us appeared less than 200,000 years ago on Earth. And they would say before that there were no humans like us. There were only more primitive ape-like human ancestors going back maybe six or seven million years. And before that, some primitive apes and monkeys going back 40 million years. And before that, uh, just primitive mammals. Before that, reptiles. Before that, amphibians. So they would say no humans like us any earlier than... 200,000 years ago. So as far as North America is concerned, they would say no human beings in North America until less than 20,000 years ago. 
So these discoveries that were reported at the Holloman Quarry in the state of Oklahoma in the 1920s were pretty amazing because they involved discoveries of uh, projectile points, in other words, spear points or arrowheads, stone spear points or arrowheads uh, found in geological formations that went back to the early Pleistocene period. And that means they could be up to uh, about 2 million years old. And of course, this isn't an isolated discovery. There are hundreds of other discoveries like this that I've documented in, in, in my book, uh, Forbidden Archaeology. But this case from Oklahoma was an interesting one. Well, I know there you have many examples. Uh, one I wanted to ask you about because it's it become quite uh, quite famous uh, uh, is like the case of Virginia Steen McIntyre in uh, in Mexico. Virginia Steen McIntyre is an American geologist who I know personally. She's a, a very courageous woman. Back in the late 1960s and early 1970s, she was involved in dating an archaeological site in Mexico. The site is the Huayatlico site, which is near the town of Puebla in central Mexico. There, some American and Mexican archaeologists had conducted an excavation and they had uncovered stone tools and weapons in some layers of rock there. And they wanted to know how old these things were. So they called geologists to the site to use their science to get an age for these artifacts by dating the layers of rock in which they were found. So Virginia Steen McIntyre and her colleagues used four different methods to date the site. They used the uranium series method to date cut animal bones that were found in the same layers with the stone tools and weapons. They use the zircon fission track method to date a volcanic layer of ash that lay above the layer with the stone tools. They use four different methods, and they got an age of about 250,000 years for the site. And, and the, orthodox, was, the orthodox view is that it couldn't be anything over 20,000, right? That's right. That, that was... And that's still pretty much the case today. It, there, it's, it's, get, it's very difficult for most scientists to accept anything like 250,000 years, first of all, because they think there weren't any humans anywhere in the world capable of making the advanced kinds of stone tools and weapons that were found at Hoyatlico. And second, they had no way of understanding how they could possibly be present in North America, even if there were. So it was quite a shocking discovery. The archaeologist, uh, Cynthia Irwin Williams, who was in charge of the excavation, was shocked by these dates that came from her own team of geologists, and uh, she wouldn't publish them. So Virginia Steen McIntyre and her colleagues independently published the age for the site, but when they did that, they experienced an extreme negative backlash from their colleagues in the scientific world, and then everybody just shut up about the case. Nobody would talk about it anymore. So for many years, the case was lying in oblivion. Until uh, I found out about it, and Richard Thompson and I wrote about it in Forbidden Archaeology, then something pretty amazing happened. There was a television producer named Bill Cote in uh, New York City who was producing 
a documentary called The Mysterious Origins of Man for broadcast on NBC. And he'd gotten a copy of Forbidden Archaeology, and he got in touch with us and wanted to include some of the cases from the book in the documentary. So I told him about Virginia Steen McIntyre and how her ages for the Huayatlaco site in Mexico had been suppressed. And he found that very interesting. So he got in touch with her and he took her down to the site in Mexico and they did filming there. And this uh, segment aired in the documentary. And when that happened, it caused a little bit of a stir. Uh, there was a, a, a maverick archaeologist named George F. Carter who was at Texas A&M University, he saw the documentary and it reminded him of the case. He had heard about it through his contacts, the, you know, the different rumor mills that kind of circulate in archaeology. So he was in touch with Virginia Steen McIntyre and he got a philanthropist interested in funding new research at Wyatt Laco and the new research uh, which has been published in a book by archaeologist Chris Hardiker called The First American, uh, confirms the dates that Virginia Steen McIntyre and her colleagues originally got for the site. It's really, it, it's just a, an extremely fascinating case. It really blows open our whole picture of the peopling of the Americas. Well, why do you think uh, mainstream science, the mainstream paleontology in this case, um, pose, objects so strenuously to this kind of research? Well, I think there's a lot of reasons for that, Doug. In, in one sense, it's just human nature. Uh, you know, for example, if I love somebody and somebody tells me something bad about the person I love, I don't want to believe it. I I may even become angry at the person who tells me these things. So today, many scientists are very much in love with their theories of human origins, peopling of the Americas. They've got a lot invested in them. So when they hear things that radically contradict what they have come to accept as true, uh, there can be some negative blowback that, that can happen. And I think it also has something to do with you know, power. Uh, there are different kinds of power in the world. There's political power, there's economic power, there's military power. There's also intellectual power, which is a very real power, although a subtle one. And we see the people who have power don't really like to give it up very easily, especially if they have monopoly power. So for you know the past century or so, the supporters of the currently dominant theories of human origins have had uh, a government enforced monopoly in the education systems in most countries in the world. And they rather jealously exclude alternative views from being expressed in those education systems, which has the effect of First of all, making them feel very good and delegitimizing the alternative ideas. So uh, I think there's a, a lot of reasons behind what I call a knowledge filtering process that operates in the world of science, not just in the field of archaeology, but in, in terms of physics, uh, consciousness studies, alternative energy, alternative healing, uh, evidence for the paranormal, evidence for extraterrestrials and UFOs and things of that sort. The, the knowledge filtering process operates in a, a lot of different fields. I've kind of concentrated on how it operates in archaeology. You're kind of talking about the kind of things we do in Atlantis Rising. <laughs> Well, I, I think Atlantis Rising is an excellent publication where you can get the full range of 
topics of alternative and alternative science. It's uh, really an excellent publication in that regard. Uh, I, I think that's where people are going to learn about these things these days. They're not going to learn about it in their classrooms in high school and university. They're not going to learn about it in the textbooks there. Um, but fortunately, there are channels of information where people can learn about these things, publications, periodicals like Atlantis Rising, uh, different radio and television programs, the web, things like that. So well, I think you're making an excellent contribution well, thank towards you. the dissemination of, this alter of these alternative views. Let's um, uh, kind of get into where some of the controversy that exists within our our own community of alternative thinkers. Uh, I was, uh, in your case, I was thinking that um, though you've provided a lot of evidence uh, that the remains of modern humans uh, date from much earlier than considered possible, yet. Um, you still you agree more or less with the basic timeline of natural history put forward uh, by ac the academic establishment. Am I right? And, and I'm talking about like the age of the Earth and and the the long time periods, what some call deep time. Yes, that's uh, basically I I I do accept the. The idea that the Earth has a long history in the low billions of years. So, yes, that that is basically correct. Well, I, I, I wanted to mention a couple of arguments and see what you uh, had to say about them. For example, sure. uh, uh, I've heard it stated that, uh, for example, if cosmic dust, which falls to Earth at a predictable rate, uh, had accumulated over the billions of years claimed that the planet would be uh, buried in a blanket of such dust many miles thick. And, and then there are other arguments, including uh, continental erosion rates, uh, our distance from the moon, uh, et cetera, all of which suggest that the time span attributed to Earth's history uh, could be a lot less than commonly believed. Uh, what do you say to arguments for a much younger Earth than is maintained by the academic establishment well you know I it, it would depend upon how much younger the claims are right well we're uh, not talking 6,000 years <laughs> I'm talking a few million you know or perhaps uh, 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 yeah maybe because a, well <clears throat> as opposed to billions Yes. Uh, well, the way I look at it is people have a right to make whatever case they think makes the most sense to them. Uh, I personally don't find, you know, those arguments persuasive. You know, I, I'm, I, I myself don't accept the age yeah, completely the the uh, system of ages my my ages are in the same ballpark you might say as as the ages of the same current order. scientific consensus same order of magnitude but, uh, same order of magnitude although not exactly yeah you know, the same yeah and uh, and what I, you know, I, I, you know, most of the ages obtained by the modern scientific community are based on the known rates of decay of various radioactive elements, which have certain half lives. And you know, by measuring using different radiometric dating methods, they've arrived at these ages. That's where the ages of billions or hundreds of millions of years come from. And I'm prepared to accept that. Now, I will say, I mean, just 
in the interest of disclosure, a lot of my ideas about the age of the earth and the antiquity of the human species are coming from my studies in the ancient Sanskrit writings of India, which I've been a follower of for about 40 years now. And they speak of these vast periods of time. Now, it may be <clears throat> that the modern scientific dating methods are wrong, but even apart from that, I would still, based on spiritual commitments that I have, accept a long age for, for the Earth. Well, could you get into a little more detail about um, the um, the concept that you're uh, alluding to in terms of the Vedic or Hindu concept of time there? Yeah, the, there's a cyclical concept of, of time. And the basic unit of that cyclical time is called the Kalpa or the day of Brahma, it lasts for 4,320,000,000 of our solar years. And it's followed by a night of Brahma that also lasts for 4,320,000,000 years. And then there's another day, another night, another day, another night. It goes on endlessly. And according to the Vedic cosmological calendar, we're now in about the middle of the current Kalpa, or Day of Brahma. It uh, lasts, as I said, about 4,320,000,000 years. We're in the middle now. So the current Kalpa, or Day of Brahma, began about 2 billion years ago. And you know, during the nights of Brahma, life including human life in the universe is dormant during the days it's active. So on that basis, I would expect to see evidence for a human presence on earth going back about 2 billion years to the beginning of the day of Brahma, because according to the Vedic text, humans have been present since the beginning of the day of Brahma or the Kalpa. And basically, if you look at all the archaeological evidence, that's what you find. Now, that Kalpa, or day of Brahma, is divided into sub-cycles called Manvantars, each one lasting about 300 million years. We're now in the seventh Manvantar of the current Kalpa. And that means there have been six before us. And the Vedic texts state that between each Manvantar, there is a devastation that wipes out life on Earth. So according to that understanding, there would be six devastations, huge devastations in the history of life on Earth. And according to modern paleontology, there have been six major extinction events in the history of life on Earth, spaced at intervals of several hundred million years. Uh, the last such extinction event being the one that wiped out the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. So there are some parallels between what modern paleontology tells us and what the ancient Sanskrit writings have to say about periodic devastations that take place in the history of life on Earth. Now, you basically are uh, guided by the teachings of the uh, modern Hindu sage Swami Pradupada, if I understand correctly. And, yes, he, uh, he was my spiritual master, Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, yes. And I understand, though, there are differences between... Um, his view of the time cycles and those of other influential uh, Hindu scholars. I'm thinking about Sri Yutaswar. Um, True. Can, can you uh, kind of elucidate what that's what that would be about? Um, <clears throat> well, the the standard view in the Vedic texts themselves 
and you know the teachings of the vast majority of gurus historically in India have accepted what we might call the the long yuga cycles. Um, <clears throat> Sri Yukteswar, who lived in the late 19th century and early 20th century, uh, was trying to harmonize these vast Indian time cycles with uh, the ideas that were current at his time period, the late 19th century, where even in Europe and America, the idea of a very young earth was very prominent you know, based on you know, biblical calculations. Even many scientists in those days were accepting a young age for the earth. So he was, this is just my analysis, uh, he was trying to shorten the Indian cosmological time cycles to match up with a, a shorter age for the earth. And he he tried to tie the uh, yuga cycles, which are a cycle that lasts, according to the traditional calculations, about 4,320,000 years, to the precession cycle, which lasts for about 20 Six thousand years, and it, we should roughly uh, we should interject uh, what the precession, precession cycle is, since it comes up so frequently. But it's the um, the cycle which people say is associated with the wobble of the Earth's axis, and others say related to a binary star. But nevertheless, it's uh, it's about twenty five thousand years uh, for the to p make one pass through the zodiac. Right. In reverse. Yeah, the the uh, that's correct. Counts for things like the, the, the age of Pisces and now the age of Aquarius and so forth. That was right. a, yeah. Yeah, so in Vedic astro astronomical text there is something that's equivalent to the precession cycle. Um, <clears throat> and so Still, the long yugas were also there. So, I mean, the way you know I would try to adjust these things would be to say, yeah, you could you could have uh, short yugas associated with the precession cycle if you want. But the long yuga cycles are also there. That was the traditional view in, in Vedic cosmology, which involved both knowledge of a precession cycle and the concept of the long yugas. But uh, I, I respect the right of each individual to make up their own mind about these things. As you were suggesting, even within the alternative science field, there are going to be differences of opinion. Mm-hmm. Well, certainly, uh, <laughs> we're uh, the the debate between the old Earth uh, ideas of you know the establishment and and you are up against a lot of the uh, creative design people who are not necessarily arguing for uh, the literal interpretation of the Old Testament, but are saying that uh, that the the cycles of Earth were much shorter. Uh, that a lot of the influences that we associate with uh, evolution were uh, the result of catastrophic events, as much as they were the just these incredibly long uh, periods of development that the establishment uh, lays out. And uh, I find uh, with the magazine, I, I hear from both sides. As a matter of fact, uh, I don't you, doubt it. You haven't seen the new issue yet, but I've got a letter in there from one. Uh, uh, one of my people who is uh, basically complaining about an article I ran on uh, from uh, Susan Martinez on deep time, and she's a young Earth advocate, uh, and uh, they were uh, they were complaining that I wasn't being 
sufficiently supportive of your position. <laughs> so, well, but I, I, I actually did see that issue. You sent me the PDF. Oh, yeah, you saw I, the PDF. I did look at it, and I did read that letter, and I, <laughs> I, I thought you handled it very well. And uh, the only thing that I would say is, you know, is usually when I speak with uh, young Earth people, uh, of a certain type, anyways, the more the ones that are more influenced by biblical ideas more directly, you know, I I usually am able to find some common ground with with them by saying, well, whatever the case is, human beings have been around since you know the beginning, and they didn't come in just at the end. And we just may have to disagree about the age of the earth, but humans have been around since the beginning. Uh, some of the young earth people I'm able to get along with on that basis, but uh, <laughs> there, there's a whole spectrum of ideas. And I think, uh, you know, in a, in a time like this, when, you know, for so long, the there has been an establishment, an orthodoxy in control. If 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 it gets dethroned, then I think there's going to be a lot of different schools of thought uh, engaged in some really healthy competition. Because right now there isn't healthy competition because the supporters of the currently dominant ideas have gotten governments to give them a monopoly in the education system so that these alternative ideas can't really compete on a yeah. level playing ground. Well, you know, I have always thought that, uh, for one thing, um, there are a lot of different factions, you know, within the New Age movement. and. Uh, or to use the new age term uh, and for one of a better one. Uh, but people have uh, some of these uh, factions are based on misunderstanding of the positions of, uh, of others. Uh, and you get things like, uh, I, I, it's similar in my mind to the difference between people who take the Bible literally I mean, the, the, what they, the term they used to use was the verbal plenary inspiration of the Bible <laughs> versus a more spiritual interpretation, which sees things in a, in a more of a symbolic sense. And I've seen that same split uh, transfer over into the New Age. And you have on one side people trying to interpret uh, some evidence of the past as being uh, is you have to believe that it was aliens. And then on the other side, no, no, it, you have to, you're talking about great antiquity of civilization on earth that accounts for the, uh, these anomalous, uh, the anomalous evidence that we find of advancements in the ancient past. Uh, and so you get a lot of these kinds of splits. In the meantime, the establishment sits back there and plays a kind of um, a straw man game in which they always try to associate everybody with extremes, therefore making them appear silly and like they don't, they haven't really thought through what they're thinking about. Uh, and I guess uh, my point is that's in support of what you just said. It's, it's, that's the way I can see it. Well, you know, I, I, I think you hit on something, you know, very interesting there. Uh, especially when you were talking about, uh, those who are trying to explain different anomalous discoveries related to human history and civilization by extraterrestrials, others proposing extreme human antiquity uh, or involvement of some higher conscious being, God, or whatever. I don't think these things are necessarily contradictory. Right. You know, people... As, as far as I can see, they tend to want a simple explanation, either, say, a simple materialistic evolutionary explanation where the chemicals just combine together naturally. They form some first single-cell creature, which starts forming into multi-cell creatures, which 
develop finally into human beings. You know, they want a simple evolutionary account, or they want a simple extraterrestrial account that at you know, some point in history, some ETs came, they manipulated the genome of whatever was happening here and turned it into humans like us. In other words, they want a simple extraterrestrial account. And then there are others who may want a simple creation account that God in the beginning just created human beings, Adam and Eve and whoever. And so people tend to want simple explanations, simple creation accounts, simple extraterrestrial accounts, or simple evolutionary accounts. But the real story may be more complicated than that, I, and, and that's the way I feel. And it may involve elements of all three of those things in a complex tapestry. In other words, I think there is some overall guiding cosmic intelligence that's responsible for some of the order and complexity that we see around us, the existence of consciousness and things like that. I think there is a kind of evolution in terms of gradual development that takes place, but not exactly the kind that uh, most scientists are thinking about today. Uh, they tend to think that the first living thing would be the most simple. I happen to think it would be the mo more complex forms came first, and things devolved from there. Uh, they and and I think it has an extraterrestrial element to it as well. You know that there is life scattered throughout the universe, and there are interconnections between life on Earth. And so I think it, the the real story may be a little more complex and it may involve elements of all the kinds of things that supporters of you know these different more simplistic views are talking about how do you think uh, concepts like karma and reincarnation fit into the kind of um, of um, evolutionary scheme that we're uh, envisioning here well <clears throat> i think they definitely apply because what i proposed in in, in books like Human Devolution is that there is an evolution of consciousness. It's not the evolution of the physical forms. The key concept is to understand that a material body is a vehicle for a conscious self. And the conscious self has an origin beyond the world of matter, what I would call the level of pure consciousness or whatever. But if a conscious self comes into the world of matter, it needs a vehicle in which to function here. And those vehicles are what we call bodies. And there's a variety of vehicles ranging from amoebas up to human beings because consciousness itself has different levels of awareness. It functions according to different desires and aspirations. So according to those different states of consciousness, there are different types of bodily vehicles. And in the process of reincarnation and karma, it's possible for a conscious self to evolve through all the different types of bodily vehicles finally arriving at the human form in which it can exercise its free will so as to get free of the cycle of karma and reincarnation and go to the level of pure consciousness beyond birth and death, beyond karma and reincarnation. So there is kind of an evolution of consciousness by the laws of karma and reincarnation. That's how I would see it. Well, I I would tend to agree with you. Uh, talking now, of course, karma and reincarnation are, of course, are, are a major part of the uh, of the Hindu uh, Vedic teachings uh, that you subscribe to. Uh, and of course, uh, what we're talking about, these teachings, come from the, the, the Hindu scriptures that you find. What what kind of a picture do they paint of the 
the planet's past. Uh, what kind of a story do they tell? And I'm well. <laughs> the they would tell a story that involves a multi-level cosmos, uh, where you have essentially one level dominated by ordinary matter, which is where we find ourselves now. A more beyond that, a more subtle realm of subtle mental and intellectual energies inhabited by beings adapted to the conditions there. People might call them astral beings, gods, goddesses, angels, jinn. People in different cultures have different names for them. And finally, beyond that, there's a level of pure consciousness inhabited by beings adapted to the conditions there. And there, all the conscious selves exist in loving harmony with each other and with a source of all conscious beings. But if a conscious self becomes egotistical, it needs some other place to exist because it can't act selfishly on that level of pure consciousness. So what we call planets or celestial bodies or worlds or universes are more or less virtual reality systems for conscious selves to act out their selfish desires to control, dominate, and exploit matter and other conscious selves. <clears throat> So that's what a planet is. It's like a little uh, reservation, a little prison house to use, a, or asylum to or, use a heavier word. Or a schoolroom. Or a schoolroom uh, for conscious selves. And, <clears throat> you know, just like in uh, school, there's, different times for different classes. So there's different ages, time. You know, there's a time function that goes on here. <clears throat> and um, periodically, uh, the school is emptied out, but it gets repopulated from, you know, the higher levels of the cosmos periodically. Someone so, might call that... Uh... Uh, initiation. Huh? Yeah. So, uh, but the idea is not to stay here in the cycle of reincarnation, but it's to go to the level of pure consciousness. So there are different systems of consciousness transformation you know, that you can find in worlds, many wisdom traditions, different systems of contemplation and meditation and yoga that are meant to help raise consciousness to a higher state now the 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 hindu scriptures uh, describe uh, uh, a lot of advancements in, in the ancient past uh, technologically and otherwise do they not well this is something that i've talked a little bit about in some of the episodes of ancient aliens that series that's aired on the history channel over the past few years uh, the ancient Sanskrit writings speak of Vimanas, spacecraft. They give descriptions of, of, of various types of them. Uh, the ancient Sanskrit writings also speak of weapons resembling modern nuclear weapons. They were called Brahmastras. It's described in the Mahabharata that when such weapons were used, it would be as if you had millions of suns concentrated in one place, giving off tremendous amounts of radiant energy like that. So uh, I've always just found it fascinating that the scientists in charge of the American program to develop the atomic bomb during World War II Dr. Robert Oppenheimer was a student of the ancient Sanskrit writings of India, and you know he was very much aware of these descriptions. And when the first atomic bomb was tested at Alamogordo in New Mexico in 1945, he was in the bunker there. And when he 
saw it go off, he began reciting some of these Sanskrit texts that refer to this phenomenon of like having the energy of millions of suns all concentrated in one place. So, uh, yes, these ancient Sanskrit texts, Vedic texts, do describe some pretty interesting things in terms of technological development. Well, uh, what kind of a, an age do you think we're talking about for the Vedas themselves? How, how long do you think they, uh, how far back do you think they go? Uh, and I'm not talking about what they talk about, but the actual texts themselves. Well, the Sanskrit word Veda means knowledge. And originally it is said to have existed in the form of sound vibration. But at a, and it's ultimately it's knowledge that's been there since time began or even beyond because knowledge is always present in a consciousness based universe. So it's always been there, but at certain points in history, it gets recorded in textual form because in previous ages, people had very good memories. Even today, we see some people with very good memories who can memorize whole books or telephone books or whatever. But most of us have very short memories, and therefore, uh, you know, it's not enough for us to just hear knowledge. We can't retain it in our short-term memory, at least. So we require different types of text and digital means of recording things to keep the knowledge available to us. So the old, the oldest texts go back uh, a couple thousand years, but the system was is that you know they would keep copying text. You know they would write text on a perishable material. When it would get old, they would copy it again, copy it again, copy it again. So, uh, so the oldest text that we have in museums today or libraries today would be, <clears throat> you know, maximum of you know between a thousand and two thousand years old. But the knowledge contained in the text is actually eternal. Well. Uh I wanted to kind of connect it a little bit to some more concrete things. Uh, for example, um, well, I was going to ask you about the Sarasvati River, but first, uh, do you think, uh, what do you think of the Aryan invasion hypothesis? Uh, what's wrong with it? Uh, do you think it's racist? You might explain what I mean by that. <laughs> well, this is, I mean, today, Vedic culture is, the dominant culture in the Indian subcontinent in the, in the country of India today. You know, by Vedic, I mean knowledge that is derived from the Sanskrit text. And when European scholars first came to India several hundred years ago during the colonial period, they noticed that the Sanskrit language <clears throat> was related to the European languages. Actually, uh, they considered them to be part of a family they called the Indo-European languages because German, French, Italian, Russian, Greek, all those l languages are related to Sanskrit linguistically, grammatically, and so on. And, you know, that uh, led to a question in, in their minds. Well, what is the nature of the relationship? Sanskrit was the oldest of the languages, so one way to look at it was, well, that the European languages and the people who spoke them were somehow derivative from India. In other words, the European peoples and European languages came out of the Sanskrit 
language and speaking people of what's now called India. And that wasn't a very acceptable idea to them, so they proposed it was the other way around. Actually, uh, there was some original Indo-European language in India, and Sanskrit and the Sanskrit-speaking people came from somewhere in Europe and migrated into India about 3,500 years ago. Now, you find no such description in any of the ancient Sanskrit texts. They never say, we were way, way over here somewhere, and then we came, came from the north down into India about 3,500 years ago. They speak of being present in India forever, basically. So, so it is a, an issue. This uh, idea that the Sanskrit-speaking people came into India about 3,500 years ago is something that still accepted by most scholars and scientists in the West, and even in India, they've also accepted that idea, many people, because the British uh, ran the education system for hundreds of years there, and you know they more or less accepted it also. But <clears throat> there are some researchers in the West and in India who are not supporters of this, what they call Aryan invasion or Aryan migration concept, and are proposing that the cultures that were in India thousands and thousands of years ago were, in fact, uh, Vedic or Sanskrit, using Sanskrit as their, their sacred language. So there's some evidence for that. You were mentioning the Saraswati River. But there's a uh, a Vedic text called the Rig Veda. It's considered to be one of the oldest extant Vedic texts, and it it uh, describes five major rivers that existed in northern India: the Ganges, the Yamuna, the Saraswati, and the Indus, and one other one whose name escapes me right now. Four of those rivers are still present, but the Saraswati is gone now. You can only see the dry channel of it from NASA satellite photos. Uh, and that's kind of interesting because the uh, Vedic, that the last time you know, the Rig Veda describes the Saraswati River as a vast flowing river. And geologists have shown that the last time the river was flowing was over 5,000 years ago. So that means the authors of the Rig Veda had to have been in India observing the Saraswati River there over 5,000 years ago, which is before the time they supposedly, according to the Aryan migration idea, migrated into India maybe about 3,500 years ago. So uh, that is a pretty interesting case right there. Well, we're talking about evidence. One of our uh, theme dear to our hearts is the idea of a uh, pre-Diluvian civilization. And um, you've got not only uh, Sarasvati River and all of the settlements that, that they found in the area, but you've got then in the Gulf of Gambay offshore, you've got underwater evidence. And then uh, you've got in other places, uh, what in Dwarka, uh, an underwater uh, city estimated to be 12,000 years old. I mean, you may not buy into that, but it's pretty interesting. <laughs> no, it, it is. And, and even, it, it's just accepted by modern geologists and modern archaeologists that over the past you know, 10 to 20,000 years, these sea levels have been rising around the world. 
uh, they've risen quite a bit uh, because you know the basic idea is is that you know before about 20,000 years ago the earth was in the midst of a huge glaciation which means a lot of the water from the oceans was being stored in land in the form of huge glaciers ice caps and over the past 10 to 20,000 years those ice caps have gradually been melting which means that ocean levels have been rising which means that areas of the world that were inhabited 10 or 20,000 years ago are now under the water so marine archaeology or underwater archaeology is becoming a major field even in mainstream archaeology and as you were pointing out uh, these marine archaeologists and others who are investigating the sea bottoms near the continental edges are actually discovering you know remains of ancient cities in these depths as in the Gulf of Cambe where there were uh, scientists from India's oceanographic survey doing sonar scanning of the ocean bottoms off the coast of northwest India and they began seeing patterns that looked like streets and buildings deep underwater so they did some dredging and they dredged up human artifacts evidence that there was human habitation down there and they did dating radiocarbon dating and other types of dating that indicated ages of up to 30,000 years which would really be amazing yeah. and then uh, marine archaeologists headed by a, a Dr. Rao also did dives off the coast of India and found the remains of a sunken city of Dwarka also so it's a it's a growing field you know, even in conventional archaeology, this well, uh, underwater archaeology. Well, we're, we're, we're about done here, but I wanted to just kind of uh, throw this at you. Um, do you think the, the characters in the Hindu legends uh, were strictly imaginary, or uh, do you think they were real historical figures? Oh, I, I think they were real historical figures. Um, they like Krishna for example you you would say that he was there was a real Krishna yes well to understand you know, the concept of Krishna Krishna is one of the Sanskrit names for God which means uh, a being a supreme conscious being who exists on some higher level of reality and is the source of everything ultimately all the energies and forces that are existing come like, from some ultimate source like an archetype but, yes but according to the ancient sanskrit text that personality who exists at that higher level can come and visit this level of reality as an avatar avatar i mean there was this film a few years ago called avatar but it's a Sanskrit word. It means one who comes from a higher level to a lower level. So although Krishna is the supreme conscious being, the source of everything, uh, he can manifest a presence on this level of, of reality. Like, uh, and for however long he wants. So the ancient texts record you know, such descent of Krishna to this level of reality. And they are assigned to different times. So I, I do regard them as historical events. Well, thank you very much, Michael. We, uh, it's been very interesting. And Thank uh, you. We've been talking with author, researcher, and Atlantis Rising columnist, Michael Cremo. For more on his research into the lost history of the human race, we recommend his books and, of course, his articles in Atlantis Rising. For more on all of this, check our website at AtlantisRising.com 
Michael's website, by the way, is at humandevolution.com. This is Doug Kenyon for Atlantis Rising Conversations. <laughs>